when we work in a design software, uh, our designs tend to be either pretty small in size, or if you're not careful enough, they can go in size like that. Whatever the case, we have to know how we can handle a project of this size. My name is Otanto. Today's Arshline XP webinar is about how to handle large files. Let's take a look and see in a second. As always, I'm joined by my colleague, Mr. Illesh Pap, who's our resident architect over here. Hi there. And he's going to help me to tell you how to handle uh, larger files. Now, when we talk about large files, the term large can mean several things. Uh, we mean complicated things when you work with many, many surfaces, many items, many lines and many <coughs> objects, but we are going to cover that all. As always, I urge you to ask your questions on the right hand side, which we can answer at the end if we have the time. Um, there's, there's this chat bar over here. Test it if you can. I'll uh, even say hi to you so that way we can see if it, if it works for all of you. Um, just say hi and then we know that you're here. Okay, so when we talk about large projects, uh, there's a couple of things to cover here and we decided to also talk about some archive and project saving tips. So can you tell us in a few words what we are going to talk about today? Well, uh, when you, uh, just as you mentioned, uh, uh, sometimes projects uh, are physically large and sometimes they are just large because they are very, very complex. Uh, this can be even a small building or an interior design project or, or an architectural project. Uh, today we will uh, try to find a solution for both aspects. We will use interior design uh, drawings and architectural drawings and uh, whatever we talk about today is actually generic so uh, you can apply them uh, in all of your projects because these uh, issues are happening um, all around uh, in all sorts of projects. Yes. Uh, these are kind of uh, eternal <laughs> things yes. to, to talk about. Even if you're not a professional Arshan XP user or you're not working in large projects, it's worth to take a look at these things because they are going to give you some <coughs> nice tips about how to manage your content. Yes, because even if you are not working on large projects, some of these issues you will uh, sooner or later bump into, especially with the materials and the objects, but we will cover those later, yes. because this, that's kind of a nature of how the project uh, grows, uh, even if it's uh, initially a very small project. That's right, so let's talk with the Talk about the, the issue what I think is the, <coughs> is the major one. Uh, how about saving your project and how to handle the data that you save? Well, uh, when we are about to save our projects, and the first thing uh, that we would like to talk about is uh, how you should organize your uh, project in what sort of folders and, and actually where it is stored. By default, uh, when you start working with, with Archline, it will offer you to work in the in your documents folder, and there will be an Archline XP draw folder generated automatically, and the current year, mm -hmm. 2018, this, this, with this version, and there you will be able to automatically save and load uh, all of your files. That will be the folder that Archline by default provides as a solution to save your files and to load your files from. Actually. This is a this is a pretty good, pretty good thing because usually that's your C drive and it's easy to to maintain. Sometimes, if, if especially if you have a small uh, drive, you will need to uh, kind of find another place where you can store your drawings. Uh, so actually, that's a, that's a setting in Arsenal. If you go to the uh, settings, which is this cogwheel here, and you go to the open and save, you will find this uh, project default path. And actually, this is this is. The user, the username, documents, and Arsenal XP drop. That's the default. If you are happy with that, you don't have to change that. But if you would like to change it because you would like to change it in an extra, uh, you would like to store your projects on an external drive, which we really uh, do recommend you to save your projects yes. from time to time, uh, then you can actually change that uh, to an external drive or another um, location and then the software will store your projects uh, by default to that location and it will load the, your projects by default from that location. Now when we work in a project we have a lot of content and we have different versions <coughs> so are there any naming conventions and folder structures that you could recommend so yeah. our work would be efficient? <coughs> yes what I would recommend is that once you start working on a certain project uh, you should create um, a folder with the project name or with the client's name and under that project you should store the different milestones of this project we will talk about this later uh, now when you created this folder you should create a, a photographs folder um, documents folder or notes folder or something else as well so this is where you would 
um, story or external sources. Like if, if this is a survey project, I went to the site and I created hundreds of pictures, I will store it into the same folder next to the projects in a, in a folder called pictures or photographs. And there will be another one, uh, like uh, incoming documents from the clients, I will just store them in the documents folder and so on. So this is how you should organize. So at the end, when you are, uh, when you've worked on 10, 15, um, hundreds of projects, you will have a nice organized layout like 2018, uh, project or client name and under all the necessary files with also with the projects and then the next next client next work and so on so this is how you should store uh, the information this will make your life easier this will uh, keep the project um, and the file system as well nice and organized and it will be easier to archive as well can you show us an example of how saving <coughs> looks like in our so when would you save your things manually um, yeah and first things first work? yeah yeah first things first uh, when you create a new project uh, you draw something in it uh, and then when you click on save or save as that will uh, do the same thing the, f the software will prompt you to give it give it a file name just as in this case we have this file name with this 01 this was the first version of this uh, project and with a specific name this contains a living room only so that we named it this way so now we know that there is a file in this folder let me just open it uh, on the other screen and let's just find it well actually actually we have quite a few files in this folder let me just uh, open it up like this so you can find that there are these, there are these files. So one, when I stored my file, uh, when I click on save, it will save it. Now, last time we saved this project, it was um, a few months back. A few months back. So now if I click on save, and I just simply uh, choose to override the content, then the software, without asking anything, it will just, just do it uh, by default. And then now I go back to this and I just refresh the content and now we can see it was saved this very moment. And that's the latest uh, status of this project. So now whatever I did, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's stored in that file. But uh, I think this is a good point where we, can, we should suggest that uh, you should not work only in one single file mm -hmm. all along this project lifetime. Uh, because the projects are very, very complex and uh, if something happens with this file, I don't know, for example, my uh, hard drive is damaged at that sector, uh, life is mean. In that case, uh, this one single project is uh, broken. I cannot do anything uh, with that. So what I recommend once you reach to a point when um, when you think something serious happened, you 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 you, you took a large uh, milestone, you, you edited a lot, I don't know, you worked an, an hour on it, then you should go and save it with another file name as well. So you, ju you should go to the file, save project as, and then you should say, okay, let's just save it. And then in that case, you should name it with, for example, a number. So this is the second mm -hmm. version, the third version, the fourth version of this project. So at the end, you will end up with perhaps 30 files, but it's much better than losing one single file and then losing the project than to have quite a few files and then just keep the last one if, if everything is, is fine and then just archive that one. When would you do that? When would you do manually saving like that? Now, um, the, the easy recommendation is that whenever you start working with a project, at that day, uh, the, the first step should be you open the project and do what I just did. Just save it, save it in a new file and you will automatically work on the new file. So the so the old file is also there, but now just because I saved it in the new file, it, the software automatically switched to the new version and it's working on the new version. So whatever happens with the second version, uh, I still have the option to go back one version back, uh, before because I have the manual save uh, of this uh, project. So far we talked about manual saving, yeah. but we do have a security backup archive, which is a sort of a, a lifeline for you to, to restore projects if they are damaged. It's very important to know what the difference is. This is not an actual save, right? Yeah. Yes, that's, that's right. So when we talk about backup archives, those are uh, seriously and strictly for backup purposes. I mean, um, security uh, backup purposes. So whenever some issue happens, just as I mentioned, your hard drive could be broken or something like that, and that single file is damaged and you cannot do uh, anything with that, you can be sure that if everything was working fine, then the software made uh, a backup copy of that. And if 
those things that we are talking about are falling into their places, then uh, then you can at least go back to that uh, mm -hmm. fail-safe version. Let's say this is a fail-safe uh, option. So what's that? That's the, just as you mentioned, it's the backup archive. The backup archive is based on a setting which you can find in the uh, settings dialog. And it's in the open and save in this one. So what you can see here, there's a, there's this uh, backup archive here, this, this whole segment here is talking about this, this uh, thing. So what happens? Uh, the software automatically creates backup archives. That's a default setting here. Daily backup copies for every, every uh, yes. purposes, for recovery purposes. So uh, when I click on save, the software saves the current version and automatically creates a backup. Where, where this uh, backup is? This backup is in a hidden folder. It's, uh, it's called archive. I will uh, find it for you. And this archive folder uh, stores uh, up to uh, three um, backup copies uh, of this project daily. Of the same file. A, ma a maximum, yeah, of the same file, yeah. So whenever um, I click on save, this thing will happen. So let's just go back and try to find this file. I think I should enable... Um, the yeah, hidden, it hidden items are enabled. By default, the software will, will create uh, these archives if I don't change this setting. The software will create these archives in the documents in Arsenal XP Draw 2018, that's where we are now. And uh, there will be uh, an, an, an archive folder uh, behind this. It's, it's hidden now, we cannot see it because um, this, is a, this is a hidden system folder. So when I open up that uh, folder, I will see that there is a copy of that um, version and then uh, I can recover it. But the reason why the software hides it because you should not uh, manually find hidden files and folders and things like that. The software has a tool for that. So that's, only, that's mainly for the software, so it does so, so, the so, backup. Yeah, that's just, I explained how it works, but you shouldn't dive deep and find those files mm -hmm. manually. Actually, there's a tool for that. You should go to the uh, file and there's a tools and it's called the drawing recovery manager. So whenever some, something happens and you would like to recover an old work or a, or a previous version of the current damaged work, you should use this. This actually allows you to find projects in a, in a certain location with a search term. Now I know that this uh, part, like, let's say even the living uh, room, is it, it's, this is part of the project name. So if I click on search, and if the, it was stored in this location, it, it's in this moment it's not there, uh, it should find something. Actually, I will have three options, the backup files, the archive directory, whichever I'm, I'm willing to find, I will find something like this. So now actually I was looking for an archive, mm -hmm. a backup archive, a, a fail-safe backup archive. Uh, and now we can see that, yeah, it is today, yeah, it's today and it's, Today, I have created a backup once when I opened it and I saved it, and another time when I made another copy. So now I have the option to select any of these and open it and discard whatever I have in the background yes. and then start, and start save working it on as, this. As another name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You really should do that. If you, if you recover a, a, a copy and you open it, then the first step you should do is, is what I mentioned to save as. So you have the fail safe copy at where it should be and you have the normal version and then you can start working with that. So this is a, an easy tool to find and recover projects. Um, and actually, we will talk about these uh, also as well, what sort of other uh, options you have, but the backup archive, the fail-safe backup archive is for that reason. Actually, ArchLine is pretty uh, kind of uh, helpful um, to trying to keep uh, your files. Let's just go back and because there is, I think one another thing that I did not mention about this backup archive, and it's here that um, the software by default automatically also cleans up outdated archives. Now, outdated archives are uh, determined to be outdated after two weeks automatically. Mm -hmm. So imagine I'm working on this project uh, in January and then now today I open this, uh, um, this software uh, then the backups of those uh, January files are not there. The files themselves, the projects themselves are of course there, but the backups are gone because they are older than two weeks. So that's okay. why these, these are not for um, saving them for future use, 
these, these are really just fail-safe archives because they are automatically discarded after a time. And uh, can you crank, <coughs> crank up this number to a higher value to have more weeks of, of leverage? Yeah, you can uh, if you have enough storage because you should know that, of course, these eat up the same space. It's actually not a copy of that file, mm -hmm. uh, the same amount. So if you're working on a uh, 100 megabyte large file, then it will double the space, triple the space, four, uh, quadruple the, the space simply because you do uh, archives uh, of those. So if you have tiny amount, you should keep this value low. If you have a large drive, uh, you, sh you can crank it up. Uh, the only thing that we, we do not recommend, you should not ever uh, disconnect or, or disable these options yes. because these are really for you. These are for uh, the safety of your projects. Apart from the backup archive, uh, we know that the software does automatic saving on its own. Yeah. What are the terms for that? So what are the regulations? Uh, how does that work? Well, uh, this is also something that we should talk about, the automatic project saving, uh, because I think there is something that, uh, that is easy to be misunderstood. This automatic project saving uh, will not, uh, how to say, save you from uh, saving your files manually. So mm -hmm. if you would like to have a copy of your file, you really should go there and push this button and save it. Now, what this means, uh, this uh, this automatic project saving, it's again, it's a setting here, and I think this is this is even a better name. It's it's auto recover information. I see. It's actually not saving the project itself. It saves an auto recover information. This happens automatically when you open up a project. The software creates this auto recover information. And what this does, this is actually helping when you develop a project, and for, uh, we will simulate this soon. And so for example, there is a power outage uh, here uh, and uh, simply the computer turns off and I had no chance to save my project and uh, so what then? Uh, normally, I would think I have lost everything, but uh, you will what see you how this... What you have done since the last manual saving. Or, uh, yeah, at least I have the, 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 the last manual saving. But uh, actually, this system is, is, is pretty neat on this. Uh, I will show you how this works. So now it's enabled. By default, it's enabled. You should, you should keep it enabled. And the save frequency in steps is set to 5. That's the default. What that means. Now, I'm starting to create... Uh, I don't know. Let's just place a few walls, like start walls around, I don't know, and just draw something around here. It's just one step. This, this is one step when I create an item. Another step. That's the third, fourth. fourth and that's the fifth. And then it was giving us this info, information. It was saving. It yes, was at, the, at the bottom, we could see a uh, uh, link yeah. saying that it, it was just saved. So, so every fifth step, this will happen. So now I do a sixth step. And now let's just try to uh, simulate a uh, shutdown, a power shutdown. I yeah, just, we just open uh, up the task manager on the other screen and we just kill the software. Yeah, I'm so just killing because if it the would, software. If it like, would escape, then the software would ask us if we want to save, but that's not what we wanted. So uh, we just simulated a power uh, outage. Okay, so let's see what happens then. I'm starting up ArchLine. Normally I started the software. I'm waiting for ArchLine to come in up. The splash is on the other screen. Okay. That's uh, something what we will see soon. Uh, the software is not asking us to find the file and load anything, but it's automatically doing something. Yes. And this is what happens. Mm -hmm. it, it, it found this auto-recover information because I had no chance to save the project and, and, and close it normally, because if I do that, then this information is automatically by default discarded. That's the normal way. Uh, but if that was not erased and uh, because there was some error uh, happening then this is what i will see a warning that the software was trying to recover something after a serious shutdown and now i should save it and i just really do that i, I now i should uh, go and save this project as now i think i will save a third version of this just to make sure that i'm not overwriting something with a faulty uh, Copy. Now you might say that this is being too overprotective with your files, but <coughs> if you have ever lost any project whatsoever, then you would know how important this is. Yes. Uh, one thing to point out here, and this is where we get into the handling large projects territory, is that if, if you <coughs> save everything every five steps, then you know saving takes some, some processing power. And if you have a complicated project, then saving takes a couple of seconds. 
if you do that every five steps, then that's, that could be overwhelming and, and unnecessary. So Yeah, no one wants to wait every five steps just to save the, the complete project. Yes. This is a small project now, uh, but imagine this is growing, I don't know, 100 times larger. And then th the thing that you mentioned will happen. So um, how can I uh, kind of avoid that? Uh, I should go to the open and save. And there is this option, the save frequencies. This, this is what I should change. I should never turn off the save recovery information. That's that's there for a reason. Uh, if anything else falls, then you can uh, turn it off. But I would not recommend you to ever turn it off. Instead of that, you should change the frequency. So instead of five steps, you will have to wait a little bit uh, after 30 steps, which is much better uh, than, of course, every five steps. But you should uh, keep this uh, fail-safe option because, see, whenever this uh, thing happens, you will at least have a fail-safe copy. Because sometimes this uh, issue happens when you already forgot to save a manual copy of three hours back, and then you know yes, it's, then, uh, then it's, it's easier to, 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 to go, go back and wait sometimes a little bit than just to lose uh, all right. those work. Now, so much about saving. Now let's talk about how to manage the project content because that's that's actually the core of, of our uh, yeah. of our presentation today. Uh, when it comes to managing the project content, what we are going to show you now is not restricted to large or small projects. These are, you know, ideas that you could use in any kind of situation. So let's talk about how to uh, manage the project content. <coughs> there are actually two things that we could talk about: handling the the uh, layers. Yep. And handling and the, the perspectives and the views. Yeah. And actually, uh, there is a third thing which we will uh, cover as well, how you can manage the content here in the catalogs because there's, that's another uh, important issue. So now we have a project, small or large. Again, this is uh, a complex a complexity issue, uh, not because of the size of the project, but because it becomes more and more complex when even if it's have having only one room or, or two rooms. Now, this issue is coming with first with the, with the layers. Now, I have this layers and views saved here. And if I click here, I can see this dialog coming up. This is called the uh, layer properties manager. And whenever I, I dial up, up and down, I will find that I have these uh, layers and views uh, here. I mean, sorry, layers only. Now, whenever I create something, like I draw a wall or I uh, place an object or anything else like that, I will uh, find um, those items uh, to be created. Let's just go with this on one, for example. Layers. Uh, this wall falls automatically to the wall exterior. Uh, internal walls will go to another layer, slabs will go to the slab layer, and so on. This is how ArchLine automatically organizes the architectural part uh, of, the, of the model. So if I'm working on an architectural version of this, um, this model, uh, mainly uh, I'm just reorganizing the content or I just acknowledge that, okay, th those are fine. I would like to bring in, I don't know, electrical accessories and so on, and then I, I organize them to another, another place. How to reorganize content, that's another uh, thing. So if I'm about to organize these uh, furniture, for example, to, to, to two different layers or even more, uh, then what I need to do is just first I need to select it, this, this uh, item, and then here on this drop down, I can find another layer and put that onto that other layer. Mm -hmm. uh, What's the benefit <laughs> of, of reorganizing the, the content to certain layers? Uh, if you reorganize the content, first, the first uh, benefit is that you can um, manage the content to a level where you can handle it. I mean, if you would like to create a, uh, a render and it's a, it's a large project and having a lot of rooms, but you render this part only, then you are interested only in these objects. You, you don't want to render other parts uh, because they're, those are simply not visible. And yes, we know that they are not visible. We are human, we understand it easily. But for an algorithm, for a software, it's a, it's a series of calculation to find that, yeah, okay, it's not visible. But for that, I have to calculate everything. So if I don't even give this information to the software, it won't calculate with that. So that's simply not existing. So by putting things on layers that I just uh, shut down, I just disable their visibility, they won't appear in 3D, so at the end I save time. So this is one option, the visual uh, uh, option. The other, um, the other um, positive uh, point of uh, organizing things onto a layer is that actually I can have 
two, three, four versions of the same room mm -hmm. by simply organizing one layout to one layer, another layout to another layer, and another layer to another layer. So let's let, let me show you how this works uh, in simple. Um, if we talk about uh, interior design projects, uh, which are in complexity of the interior much more complex than the architecture uh, projects most of the time, uh, then the recommendation is that you should create at least three different layers. Those layers are, uh, the first is for the furniture. I mean, those are really strictly only the furniture, the, the desk, uh, the chair, and uh, for example, the you know, all other wardrobes and, and things like that. design element. Yeah, so th those, those things. The, Decoration that there's, there should be another layer for decorate decorative items. Those are uh, things that we can find on uh, as a decorative part, like uh, you know, there's a mobile phone or a mug or, or the or, candles or, on that or the that candles. Uh, yeah, the, table. What, what you can find here. This is this is a decorative item. This is a furniture. This is a decorative item. So this is uh, what also you should find and place in another layer. And there you should there you should create another one, the the third one, which is for lighting. So everything that is, uh, for example, here, the ceiling lights and the wall lamps and, and so on, those should fall onto another layer. Um, let me show you how you can create layers. If you go to the layer manager, there you will find all layers and the use layers. Now, if you go to the all layers, you can add a new layer here. And then let me just add a few and then rename them. Let's just rename this as well. Let me just first enable it completely. Uh, while you do, I, I explain the three icons that you see next to it. So yep, just one more thing. Now, what I will do, I will name them room name and one, two, three, and room name one, two, three, because now the reason I'm doing this is I would like to um, change this to a living room part and the dining room part, and I mm -hmm. would like to uh, be able to switch, switch back and forth. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, so one, one thing that you mentioned which was interesting is that using layers, there's, there are several benefits. One of them is to actually be able to navigate presets. So although the software puts things ma uh, automatically to certain layers, you have the ability to manually move things to other layers. And the biggest benefit of that is, is that you can easily toggle between the status of the same project, the different versions. So for instance, if you want to have one plot layout which has one version of your plan with just the walls only, another one with the lightning plan, and the other one with the furniture pieces. This is how you can do it. So you don't have to duplicate the 3D, and then you, can, then you get the, the 2D extracted out of them for every, for every version. You can do this this way, using the, the layers. Now, a few explanation about what you can see right here. If you have already used the CAD software, this might be familiar, but just to give you a quick tour. Next to the layer names, there are three icons, a light bulb, uh, sort of a, like a lock icon and the, and the printer. Now, this is pretty self-explanatory, but the light bulb means if you want to enable, that is to show or disable or hide that the content on that layer. Next to it, the, the lock shows if you, if you want to show that item, but you don't want to give the ability to the user to edit what's on the layer. Yeah. Showing the item is beneficial because you can snap things to it, so you can use it as a reference, but you're not able to change the content. The last one, the printer, uh, means that you are not able to print whatever is on this layer. <coughs> and that is very important because if Just you want to create uh, that's right. an so imported DWG that, for example, you mm -hmm. don't want to print, but you would like to print your own version. So you don't have it. to manually hide them or, or delete them before you create a plot layout. You, just, you can just keep it as it is, but it won't print. Yeah, because uh, those things that you would like to see and edit, but you don't want to print, those are the things that you would like to continuously see in your project. Uh, just you don't want to publish them because those are perhaps outdated information or really just notes for myself, just like, like to do, I, I should, I don't know, make uh, some changes in this project uh, like that. So uh, I have created a dining and a living room uh, version of what I just told, uh, three different layers. So let me just quickly show you how you can organize this. So let's say this here, these are definitely furniture uh, items, this here and even this one. So I just select these and I click here and I say this this should be the dining part so I just go to dining uh, which is here and it's a furniture okay now now they are on the dining furniture layer now, this was also put to that one okay fine this and this this these are lamps so I should reorganize them and say that these are dining lamps and this one and perhaps this one if I do not want to create another layer for the electrical symbols and uh, these two are things that should fall to dining and um, decor. 
Yeah, so now I have reorganized them. So now if I go here and I just do what you just told, I should find the living room, I'm sorry, uh, dining room. Uh, should I, I would like to turn off the decoration and the lamps. I, ju I just want to keep the furniture. I click OK. Now I don't see the lamps and the decoration, but only the furniture. That's right. You could also use the layer walk for that, right? Yeah, the layer walk is an even better tool for doing so. It's, you, this is something that you can find here. Layer walk is, uh, is giving you a list. Uh, this list is uh, here. And now you can find that you can actually enable all the layers or disable some of these. This happens by just, you know, clicking on one and clicking on the first one. This is with a shift. You select everything. And if you hold control, you can add or remove one layer from the selection. You see it real time how it enables and disables. Yeah, and it's very, very, very self-explanatory. Whenever I, I'm trying to set up a version of my project, I just set up the layers and see, now I actually forgot about one item, this, this large rug here. This should go to perhaps the decker. So I actually completely forgot about that. So I just, okay, I figured that out. I just go back and say, okay, this should also go to the dining. And it's here, dining, uh, decker. And so now, now it's uh, completely handled all together with the other uh, things. So the same thing I can do here with the living room. And then I'm able to uh, toggle between, toggle the, between different the different representations of this, uh, of this whole thing. And just imagine, you can actually create a dining furniture version one, dining furniture, uh, furniture version two, and then you can completely create a total different layout of this whole thing and then just switch between the two and then once you hit the 3d hammer this is the you know where you can uh, re update the the 3d model whatever you see and whatever you can select in the um, in the 2d it will be represented in the 3d because there was one more thing that we did not say here that's yes you can uh, enable the visibility the editability and the printability but if the visibility and the, and the um, editability are on only in that case you can see items in the 3d if if they are locked in the 2d they are not visible in the 3d because then yes. you should not be able to ha you know handle them makes sense uh, another thing regarding organizing your project content it comes with the views yeah. Now, in our time, you are able to set up perspectives, uh, which you can see on the right-hand side. Otherwise, you would mostly work in axonometric views, but if you want to show the built environment from the inside, then you would have to set up views. Now, the, the sort of issue with views is that there would be several rules that you have to work with. So you need to have some kind of system to be able to differentiate. Because you know, in the software, you are able to na navigate with, with the page up, page down keys between the views, so, which makes uh, the uh, presentation very effective. But if you don't know what happens if you push page up, then you, you're, you're not going to be too effective or, yeah. or you know, stunning. You, yeah, yeah you, you will end up uh, with a view that's just suddenly jumping from one room yes. to another one. And that's, that's something that you don't want to, uh, to do. So show us as an, as an example of how you would manage, how would you set up your views, what naming you would use to, to yeah. be effective. Yeah, we really should talk about what makes an order uh, in the views list. So. Um, when we are in the 3D and when, when we click on this little uh, eye here, that's for the perspective views, that's how you can set up perspective views in the software. Uh, by default, this list is empty. So you will start uh, giving, uh, adding new views like view one, view two, view three, uh, view three and so on. Um, but these names are not too much explanatory. So you should double click on them and you can, you can name them. And I really encourage you to do so because you will end up with a project with 30 views and you even you are the creator, you won't remember which view is for which. And another thing is that actually the software will organize views alphabetically. So it's a very wise option to say that, okay, I should have this uh, apartment one, dining one, dining one from door, dining one from the living room and living, living room, living room from the dining, living room from the terrace. To rename them, you, you, you really should just edit at any time, double click on the view, rename it and say OK, and then it will automatically fall to the proper order. And this will make an order. So when you switch between views, when you do that here, it's obvious why the order is like that. But if I do it here, now it's something that we can understand. So if I just go down that list, mm -hmm. 
See now I'm jumping from view to view and then I restart the whole view with another view and, uh, and I just go again. So you will see how that happens here. Yes. And in that list you can actually go up using this is above and below. This is actually just you know switching between views and just as you mentioned uh, the page up and the page down uh, key on your keyboard is a shortcut for that. So th these are easy to find so you can just still keep your hand on the on the uh, mouse selecting things and just switch to another view, work on something else, switch to another view and so on. It's very fast and this will make your representation of the model much more professional because you will keep showing the same exact views from consultation to consultation uh, each and every time to your client. What if you have multiple floors? How does the name, naming change? So what do you recommend <laughs> in this regard? In that case, I would recommend you to say that, okay, that's the first floor, room name and some specific or just a number and second floor and for example ground floor this this will keep it organized if you have multiple apartments that's the same but to avoid a long name it which will be really difficult to track here at the end you should somehow short it like for example if it's apartment one apartment two apartment three you should say ap1 ap2 ap3 like for standing for you know apartments and then just describe the name just to keep it short and simple but still uh, descriptive enough that you can understand what's happening behind now another topic here what happens if you have a, a complicated project <laughs> with a lot of complicated elements so how do you keep a project clean what are the good advice in, in this one okay well let's let's discuss about uh, what makes an object complex and that's a good question actually because itself it's, is small. it's not it's not a subjective thing it's something that the program tells you but yeah. based on what does that tell you yeah, see, we are actually working on the same project. Still, it's the same project, just a different version for this purpose, but that's the same layer, the same furniture, and so on. Um, first things first, uh, how we can determine whether something is complex or not. Now, we have this object downloaded. We just downloaded it from, for example, Google Warehouse. And when I click on that, uh, actually, there is one thing that will tell me its complexity. And that's here at the left hand side. It's telling me the model complexity of this chair is is minimal it's very it's a very small one so i should not have any issue with that but if i find something let's just go here uh, there's this design center i have downloaded objects uh, several times and i'm pretty sure i will find something here or here in the in the others library so let's just find for example this bench here we, which we used in a different workshop this bench is is not complex at all i can use many of these items without slowing down my computer and my project and so on. But there is another one. I think I can find it and uh, yeah, this this here. When I see that, I can tell that, yeah, I think this will be a complex thing. But when I click on it, then the software will tell me that the model complexity is very large. That means it's a, I, if I use them multiple times in my project, I pretty much sure I will have serious issues with the performance that it will slow down. These are very small things. See, they are just a few centimeters, a few times 10 centimeters. They're not large in size, but their complexity is large because they have lots of tiny surfaces. And actually, that's the thing about uh, size of the project. The size of the project is not necessarily about the the, the, physical size. the physical size, just as you show with this with this drawing at the beginning, um, there could be an issue with the surfaces. There are too many surfaces. That means the the, the project is too complex. Uh, so first things first, uh, what should I do with that? When I download things, the software will warn me about these things. I, we will talk about that soon. Uh, but if I already have something that I have downloaded and, and it's actually also somehow broken like this here, let's say I think I, I'm satisfied with this, but for example, there is, a, there is an extra pillow that I don't need. Uh, there could be another way when, I don't know, there is a standing man next to the model that you download or something. Uh, sometimes yeah, there's you some would extra. Like to, yeah, some, sometimes it's just not just the one model, but a whole bunch of other things that you download when you download an object. So how, how can you fix that? How can you fix an object when you would like to remove parts and then you would like to resave that uh, in another version? So in that case, let me just click on this and rebuild only this in 3D. So if you, if you select anything on a drawing, I think I don't know if anyone knows about this, but if you select anything on, on a project and then you click on the 3D hammer, then the software will, will uh, rebuild only that thing. Now, some funny thing happened here because I see other objects as well. I will explain that later. But uh, see now what I have here, 
this is the object here. So the object is, is now isolated from the walls. Yeah, so now I have this, uh, this object here. So if I select this, I can actually break it down, remove the pillow, for example, and then resave it. How to do that? I just have this, uh, this item here, and then I go to the interior, single object, and there, uh, sorry, uh, that's the... Uh, it's in edit. Yeah, sorry, sorry, that's the uh, modify explode. and explode. So, sorry, for, let's, let's just select it first. So modify, explode. So now it's exploded. Uh, so all the, all the particles are there. So yeah, that's the, even the, the lags and everything else is something that you can select. If you would like to get rid of this uh, messy thing around, you should just hit escape so the software gets rid of this selection. And now you can uh, select something and erase it. But see, some, something happened with this because when I click on this one, Previously, it was thought to be an object. Now it's thought to be an, a, a 3D solid. So a 3, what's a, a 3D solid? A 3D solid is something that is in between existence and non-existence. It's something which is under edit. Uh, so you should not keep anything in that status. It's just really when you edit it, it's in this status. But when you're finished with the editing of this chair, you should save it as an object instead of keeping it as a 3D solid. Because if you do that, then you will be able to select it as a ready-made object and then you can place it in the uh, so software, uh, even, even in new projects. So the suggested method is that you explode the objects back to its original uh, yeah. pieces, remove what you don't need, maybe even change yeah. some so textures if you want. To keep it simple, now the problem is that this is not something that has a name. It's just a bunch of things. Uh, so I should select it. Make sure that all parts are selected. Yeah, nice. And nothing extra is selected. Nothing extra is selected, like I don't know anything else. So I'm, I'm happy with that. I have only selected this part here. And then I go to interior, single object, and the new object. And this new object option does the whole thing reverse uh, the other direction. Now it selects everything and tells me that, okay, this is the, the the, the part, these are the part particles that will made up a new object if I say, okay, do that with an enter. And then now I save it and let's just save it as a, I don't know, give me a good name for this. Uh, armchair. Armchair, okay, that's, <laughs> that's nice. Okay, so that's an armchair. Um, I don't know, oh, oh, through, because I'm pretty sure we have a, we have a, a bunch, a, of, them a bunch of them. Let me, let me make it 22. So I saved it armchair in, in a category wherever I would like to place it. Let's place it into the living room, for example, or I even have a custom place which is called the my category where I can save anything. And let's place armchairs into my category. I should create a small... Okay, this uh, is important because now you are going to add subcategories, but yeah, th this is not like something folders. that you have to do, but uh, this just makes makes your work easier because then the content would be easier to manage. And way more organized, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So when you save that, even, even if you want, you can add some BIM parameters or just change them or just check them. Uh, let's say, okay, uh, I'm fine with all these things. That's, that will be the top view, which is also fine. I say, okay, and now this whole thing is saved as an object. Now when I select it here, I can find it as an object and I'm also able to find it in the objects library and just simply typing arm chair and I'm pretty sure I will find the armchair 022 which I have just created and now I can click it and place it many multiple copies of this whole thing around. Now again, what's the difference between this I'm just erasing those and this. This is again a 3D solid and to my surprise in this project there are other things that I when I select them these are also solids. Well, how come? What happened? Uh, this could be a mistake. Uh, for example when I have exploded uh, the whole um, um, chair uh, this is what I did uh, previously to simulate an, an, an error uh, I have accidentally selected the whole project and pushed uh, explode and then I, I have ended up with uh, you know these these things which are there even if I do not uh, build up any, anything. So when now if I just hit the 3D hammer, the software will rebuild the, the, the project. Now and now I'm fine with that because I can see that there are walls, I, there are windows and things like that. But when I click on this item and I click on this hammer, I will actually show you another way uh, as well then suddenly these things appear. But I wanted to see only this. This tells me that I did something wrong. 
because I'm full with 3D solids and we just determined that 3D solids are something that we should avoid and we should not ever end up mm -hmm. with solids only in the, in the model. So um, this is the time when you should really consider to either saving these or because now the project also contains their normal copy, their objects, you so should just duplicated. simply... they're duplicated. Yeah, they are duplicated. Okay. So you should really only just simply, you know, select and erase them because you don't need, need those double copies, which were in this case accidentally made. And then now if I uh, click on 3D Hammer and see, now nothing disappeared in the, in, from the 3D. So this means, yeah, they really were 3D so solids uh, only. The 3D solids are not existing in the, on the 2D drawing. They are not real items. Let me just rebuild the, three, uh, the 3D from the 2D. And now everything is healthy and back again, I can see uh, all those surfaces, everything is there. So really everything was duplicated or most of, the, most of my projects uh, were uh, duplicated simply because I made an issue. To realize this, you will, um, sometimes you will realize an issue like this. It won't happen many times, only a, a few dozens uh, will experience su such an issue. But when you face it, you should know what to do. And this is why we do this show here that if there are duplicates, you can get rid of, you should uh, get rid of them. And it, when you experience an issue like that, uh, you will see Z fight in rendering, that will be an issue. Uh, so you change a material and some, suddenly it starts flickering. That mm -hmm. means you have duplicates. There is, there is one copy with another material and, and there's another, another one with a Well, not under it, but on it. <laughs> yeah, on it, which is physically impossible, but here it's possible. And sometimes the, the suddenly your project starts slowing down. Literally, you, you still have not so many things, but it's slowing down. And then you should again think about, uh, is there everything okay with that? And this is how you can test it. How um, you can check the model's complexity? So are there any, any ways to... You mean the, track the, the full project? Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, if you are uh, thinking of the, 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 the complexity of your uh, whole model, you should first make sure that you rebuild the whole model. So you see the, the current status of it. So you, you won't end up with switched off layers and things like that. And this is what happened. I have rebuilt the, the whole model. Now what I can see is it's up to date. And then you should use the um, dimension measure. And there is a, um, an issue, um, a common to called um, list of elements. Now, if you click here, then the software creates a lift list about the, the project itself. It is telling me that now currently I have only 49,000 surfaces in this model. It's, that's fine. It's far from complex at this very moment. Uh, and it, it is also telling me what are the, the most complex objects. And we, and we will actually soon um, download really complex objects from two, two point of views. But now the, the complex item is this, this is something that called, this is a TV. And where, it's, where it is, if it's a large project, I, I'm happy with this option. I just, okay, make it selected. What's, which is that? That's it. Mm -hmm. So, and if I'm not, not happy with this object, now I can you know, erase that, hit delete, and now it's gone or make another decision to, to break it down, create a simpler version because I remove some parts or something like that. So now the, the decision in, is in my hand. And there is another thing with, with actually, actually complexity here, it, it's measured from three different uh, aspects. One is the, th the complexity from the point of view of surfaces. Uh, there is another one with, which is the space in memory, how, many, uh, how complex it is in the memory of your computer. Um, that's about the surfaces again, but, but uh, not for the whole project, but only for one single item. And there is the complexity for materials. If the, if the um, uh, item has too many materials, like these are only nine, six and five, these, these are fine. But if you are over like 50 or sometimes uh, you download some, something that's too complex with, with hundreds of materials, this is something that you should avoid. And now we will show uh, what that means and how the software warns you about that. Yes, let's talk about the, the built-in warnings. Uh, one warning which we have already seen is that when you reload a project that was terminated because of whatever reason, yeah. and the software told you that this is a result of an abnormal termination. Yeah. Now we have similar things built into the software just like that. So let's let's look at a few examples. Okay, so uh, when uh, let's see them from the same point of view. We will download things from mm -hmm. the 3D warehouse. Let's go to the 3D warehouse and Let's download first uh, something. I think a chandelier will be fine. Usually those are very complex. 
Uh, so uh, one, one thing that you, you said is that uh, when it comes to model complexity, there are two things to consider. One is the, the, the number of, of surfaces that could, that could make a model very large. And the yep. other one is the number of materials. And now we look one example for the, for the former and, and see, for instance, this one is, is four megabytes and there's yeah. actually 60,000 polygons more than that. Yeah, actually this is already telling us that, that if, if the file size that you download is a few megabytes, you should think about that, well, okay, maybe it's, 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 it's very complex. It's, it's, it's actually just the chandelier, uh, so it should not be too much uh, in, in, uh, in surfaces and so on. Sometimes you cannot avoid them because of trees or, and things like that, but this is something that, that the software will warn you about. This is also something that you should uh, watch here, it's a, it's, the, it's a number of polygons, it's, it's close to the surface, it's the same terminology here. Uh, so that's how many surfaces the, this this thing has. So now I'm I'm just saying okay, I, I did not notice these. I just download it, di download it, or maybe okay, despite it's complex, I need it, so I download it, and then now it is telling me that it yeah it will be complex. So maybe not necessarily, but maybe I will have an issue with that. Do you want to continue? So if I say no, the whole thing is discarded. Nothing happened. It was not downloaded. But if I say yeah. Then the software lo loads it. it. It's actually creating the 2D view now. It is, it is also taking longer than expected because you know with, with the complex thing, the, the top view generation is also longer. And then now it's still working. It's still generating. It's it's longer process. And then uh, well, likely I will end up something that's pretty. I'll just place it here. But it's going to be. But quite it's heavy you know it's already work. slowing down the workflow. See, it's very yeah. Well, it's. It's a one thing, it's not for this interior, but the other <laughs> yes. thing is that it's too complex. It's too complex. Now now I can handle it because I'm working on a, on a rather good PC. So even if it's complex, if you have a powerful PC, you can handle it. Uh, but this will slow down rendering, this will slow down the whole performance, this will slow down operations. Uh, when you do a section or something like that, it will, it will slow the whole thing down. So you should, you should uh, be aware of that. We will actually talk about the 3D regeneration and the sections and elevations as well. But uh, at this moment, it's just uh, enough to know that the software will warn you and then from that point on, you can decide whether you would like to use it or you would like to find right. something simpler. Let's look at another example in which case the number of materials would, yeah. be, would be too large. This could be a bit di more difficult to realize because <coughs> this would not be reflected in the size of the of the object. Yeah, let's find something more relevant for this project. Let me let's just find a kettle, uh, for example, for tea. Yeah, okay. Let's just go with this one, and uh, let's just find this one. I now. think this will be fine. This is just one megabyte. <laughs> yeah, shouldn't be a it's problem. The polygons are not too much, and so let's just download that. I'm I'm fine with that. Perhaps it's, it's also fitting my idea. So, well, oh, it has more than 100 materials. It has actually 290 materials. It's, this issue comes with, the, with, with how the model was, was organized, perhaps a wrong projection. There could be many, many things. Now we are, even now we are only talking about the warehouse objects, but you can download other objects uh, or import other objects like 3DS files, OBJ files, FBX files. So these are coming from different sources. Sometimes this happens. So what can you do? If you say, okay, no, uh, this actually is not meaning that the software will, won't download it. It's already downloaded in this uh, moment, but it just will discard the materials. It's good when you just would like to use a color or a simple material, something like that. You can, you can do that. If you say, yes, uh, you would like to continue anyway, you will end up with, a, with a, uh, a an object of that has a massive amount of uh, materials. And I will show you soon what that means when you handle the materials. I mean, now your project has copies of materials stored in this project. Um, when you work with the project, the software will make copies of chairs, materials, and everything else in the project. So this is why uh, you don't have to bring libraries and third-party files together with your project. That's, that's why it's enough only to send me, when we work together, you only send me the project and I will have everything in it because the software stores everything in the project. Um, so see, now it's, it's really taking long, 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 yes. long, long to uh, process. Perhaps I will need to terminate it because it's a very, very long process. So th the issue with this that it, this will generate tons of files in the materials library 
uh, that at the end you will see it's it's even not helping me anything because they are just tiny particles, tiny images uh, yes. of it's not one large material, it's just particles of a, of a larger mat material. So I think the bottom line here is that if you if you check the content of the things that you yeah. want to download <laughs> carefully, then you could avoid things like that when the project is killed because of what the yeah. want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, <coughs> so there are actually, that's the reason why we have the built-in uh, warnings to yeah. avoid these kind of situations. Now, let's talk about large projects, not the content itself, but what well, well, first let me just reload this whole thing and I, I'm just showing what's the, you know, the, the materialist which yes. we would like to yes. avoid and then we can later we will uh, discuss how you can get rid of the unnecessary uh, oh, yes, that's uh, right. materials as well. So yes, again, uh, because I, I terminated it manually um, from the task manager, it tells me that, okay, this is a fail safe copy. So let's just go to the materials and see in, in, in model, this is in the project, I can find, now I can see, I, I already have 700, more than 700 materials this for this model. And that's, that's a lot, that's a lot. That's actually, see, those are the tiny particles of that one single cattle uh, were generated. And, and, and a bunch of others here, so they, these are, this is messy. This, this is something that we should soon clean up somehow, and we will show you how. Show let's do now. it now? Okay, yes. let's do it now. So, uh, when you end up with something like this, you have tons of materials, and they are they are not in use. Why actually? Why are they there? I, I don't I don't have the cattle. Why are they there? The software when you it loads something, it automatically makes a copy of that material into the into the material li library. So you don't have to do an extra effort to find it because it's already there, which is convenient. It's it's cool. It's a very nice thing to do, but. At the end, uh, it will it, it will just grow. It, it it never cleans up by itself. But I can instruct the software to clean this up. I just go there, and when I do the regular thing, which I do from time to time, and save my project as a new version, then I enable this here: the purge unused materials, save. And now I just sometimes I name name it I don't know with the number and purged. Okay, so I will end up with a few of these at the end. It's from time to time I need to do that. And now I click on save. And the software saves it. And then, uh, now it's even compressed the materials and so on. So now if I go and uh, let's just load this project again. And go and open up again this purge one. See, now there's already a difference. The first, the, the, the other version, it was 19 megabytes. This one is only 12 megabytes. And we will see the number of uh, materials are also less. See, it's, it's, only, it's uh, literally only 80, uh, 80 or 90 materials are used in this project and the rest, more than uh, 600 was just trash already. I did not need that. So, so that's how you can get rid of things that are already yeah. in your, in your uh, Object library to yeah, design center. Yeah. So see, sometimes when you work with a project, it's natural, it's growing, but sometimes you need to do a step back and say, okay, now let's just clean it up, and then again I can. If if this project is a is a is a large project, it's a, it's a it's a building uh, completely. This can be a difference between I don't know 50 megabytes and 100 megabytes. It's mm -hmm. a, it's, you can even sometimes half the size of the of the project simply by discarding the unnecessary materials. One thing that comes to my <coughs> mind which can be connected to the design center issue is that if you work with external images, raster images, and yeah. you bring them in, sometimes you're working with high resolution images. Yeah. But the good practice here would be is that you just keep the images for as long as you need them. Yeah. Uh, you are able to obviously put them onto plot layouts, but the good practice is to, to either crop them or somehow reduce their size <coughs> and get rid of those which you actually need because they actually yeah, fill like up these here. Your, your project content. So about the raster images, the raster images are um, saved pixel by pixel. They are um, in terms of uh, if you would like to you know, store drawings, that's why we do not store drawings in raster images because they are not effective. They're not containing geometrical data, they are storing pixels and that they, they take up much larger space than the just describing the line is from here to here. That's, that's just a few kilobytes or, or even a few bytes. But uh, simply representing this in an image, it takes uh, more and more data because I literally have to write down the pixels. Uh, so that's why there's a difference between the size of the geometrical data, DWG for example, or the same DWG saved in an image file, uh, it, the, the, the last one will be larger. 
Um, so what, what we talk about now is that when you make snapshots of your project, when you make uh, um, vol views uh, with you know, all the textures, when you use uh, textured hatches, when you use photographs or renders that are pasted in the projects, that's fine. You should do that because that makes the, the, the project uh, pretty nice and, and uh, easy to, to document and more, uh, more visual. Uh, but only keep those raster images that are necessary. So don't just store them because they are part of the project. You, don't, you shouldn't do that. You just copy those, the photographs and everything else that you took on, on the spot and it's not part of the documentation. You just keep it on your hard drive. But whenever you would like to document something and you would like, like to uh, put them on the plot layout and only then you should put them into the project and keep it there. That's good, but then <coughs> let's keep at, at this project and uh, talk about how to organize the projects when they are getting larger and larger. How, for instance, <coughs> you, you, sort of, you set up or disable things to conserve on processing power. So <coughs> what are the, the tips? <coughs> Sorry. Us? Yeah, uh, well, for example, uh, now the project is growing larger and whenever I click on the 3D uh, hammer here, <coughs> it, for example, takes a long time because it is keeping uh, it, it keeps updating the elevations and the sections and, and all connected drawings. Now, these drawings can be, not, not these ones because these are layouts, but if they're, they are the, they're the original ones here, they are, they are there to be updated because they are still part of the, they are in link, uh, linked connection with the original drawing. That's why uh, there's the dynamic section and the dynamic uh, elevation. If the project is so large that it's uh, even a small modification which should be you know, represented in multiple versions and multiple drawings at the same time takes long simply because you have to wait those drawings to be updated, you can disable this option. And this option is the build 3D model and it's, and it's uh, is the keep 3D of this project updated which is responsible for the 3D. So whenever I change here something, it's automatically updated here simply because this object uh, option is by default on. And there is the other option, which is for the section window uh, itself, which I can again disable. And in that case, my um, sections and even the elevations will be desynchronized after, desynchronized after a few steps because simply they will not follow the changes. When I would like to do uh, um, an update, then I can do a manual update. I can click here and say, okay, create and refresh this section or the other one. And also I can go to the 3D uh, hammer and I can just completely reveal the whole, whole 3D of this model. So when you have larger projects, <coughs> it's better if you have a manual control over it. So automatic <coughs> updates will not uh, so hinder your design. Yeah. Another thing that, that comes up, and we have seen this several times from our users, is when they are importing external data, for instance, a DWG or DXF file. Sometimes even objects. Yes, and, and they complain that they can't see anything. And it uh, turns out that the reason they can't see anything because things are so far apart from each other. Okay, so how it happens? Um, well, this project is for that. Uh, I'm working on this project. I have imported something. I, you know, just regularly, I just do the uh, the optimal view to f to see the whole drawing, and that happens with the with the mouse wheel. I double click with the mouse wheel. I expect it to see everything, and instead of that, I can and see like anything. Uh, the the issue actually, I can see something. They're very very tiny. There's there's a black dot here and a black dot over there. Let's just click here. What's that? It's an object. Okay, let's. If I select anything and then then I uh, double click with the wheel, it will zoom zoom to the selection. Oh, but that's the chair. That's okay. Uh, I have a chair in the dining room. I should have the dining room him here. What what happened here? Again, zoom out. Uh, well, again, I cannot see anything. If I zoom here and I uh, double click, I can see that's a north sign. And actually, my my building is here, and there is something very just as you mentioned very, very far, there is another thing. This can happen when you import something that was, you know, translated to another part of the world and yes. it just kept its uh, situation. Well, in that case, you should really consider either keeping, keeping that thing or moving it closer to the project or just simply erase it because that was trash. I, 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 I don't know why, it's, uh, why it ended up there. I just erased that and from this point on, everything is uh, fixed. There could be another issue when you work on uh, projects over drawings that are imported, that sometimes the, um, 
the model is uh, is kind of breaking up mm -hmm. sometimes when you Why move around in the in the model it's it's sometimes breaking up and uh, well the uh, another clue that you should uh, check and, and figure out is this here this, these are the coordinates here and now we are working in meters so, you know whenever I move around in this on this building everything is fine but uh, well actually I'm somewhere 22 kilometers to 14 kilometers in the x and y so I'm actually this means I'm very far from the origin whenever actually it's not only an arch line issue it's an issue with with all sort of modelers you should keep your model around origin to 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 easily maintain it uh, in the renderings and the 3d as well uh, so so now the, the problem is that I can even further zoom out and now I will sooner or later I will see that actually well Yes, the drawing the is already disappeared. Yeah. The origin is very, very far. So to fix that, uh, instead of moving this whole thing floor by floor or even the whole floor to the, to the origin, I will move the origin to the, to the building and fix this issue by simply finding the command, which is the, which that's called the relocate project origin. Uh, the relocate project origin, this is, this is something that I will show you. If you do not remember where the command is, which, uh, which I do now, uh, you, can, you, you can just click there and uh, try to find it and say relocate. I remember that was part of the name, relocate. Okay, that's the relocate project origin and it's an edit move. Let's find it. Edit and it's move and it's relocate project origin. That's what I'm looking for. This is which I, I'm just putting here. I, usually I put it to the corner of the building, but the reason I'm putting it here so you will see when it happens. I click here. Yeah. Okay. So it's recalculated and now it's, now it's uh, happening there. So now the building is close to the origin. It's easier to uh, handle and I will have no issues with the 3D and I will have no issues with the positioning on Google Earth as well, because that's also something we discussed uh, previously. That's right. So this this uh, issue can mostly come up when you work with external data, yeah. but that that would be the the cure for that. Now, can you show us um, a project where you have several buildings and maybe we could talk about how to navigate within the building parts? Yes, yeah. because that's another feature that Arstein supports. If you have multiple buildings, you can not only navigate within floors but also between buildings. And that just makes the uh, the design much much cleaner and the and the process easier. Also, there I would like to show you a few ways how you can filter the project, uh, how you can tell what is rebuilt when you click on the three D hammer, uh, because that's uh, that's some that's a cool thing that you just push that and the software keeps it updating. But you can actually customize that. Yeah, I will I will also talk about that. So. Uh, that, that, that's the that's the end of this uh, discussion. First things first, uh, what is a building in Arshline? A building is not necessarily what you draw as a building. The building is something that you determine to be as a building, and it's and it's originated in the floor plan. When in the floor plan, when you click on the lay, um, sorry the floor management, you will find the current buildings uh, floor list. But here you can actually add more and more and more buildings and rename them accordingly. So if you would like to switch between those buildings that you have originally created, then you just do that. You have a you, you have a different level list. You can fully customize that. And when you click OK, now you will see that the 2D will change because now these the active black parts are part of this building, and the other one, which now gone. Uh, gray that is something that's part of the other building so this is how you can manage a complex project with multiple buildings by literally creating buildings and then draw things into that building and then draw other things into other buildings you said something about uh, rebuilding partially the 3d that, yeah. that's something rebuilding worth the, talking about rebuilding the 3d is just really that's just what that's just two things two commands one command is this create cutaway 3D view. This is a, an easy thing to cut this rectangle out of this whole project. And when it's done, I can look around. I can actually create a spectacular render if I if I want to to say to show the structure or something like that, or even work on it because now I can see inside. I can man maintain the you know the connections and so on. Uh, the other thing is that when you click uh, on this on this menu, you will find this build 3D model. Now, everything that you can find here, these are the default settings. Everything should be uh, enabled by default. Uh, when you hit OK, the software will, now actually the software will behave just as before when I put when I push the, the normal uh, 3D hammer, the software rebuilds everything because these are the settings for that. But if I only want to see walls, 
and I disable anything and I just click on the walls and I hit OK. Now the software will regenerate the whole model only with the walls and whenever I uh, switch back to the quick 3D model it will keep updating only the walls because that was the last setting that I was working with. So this way you can actually control what happens when you click on the quick 3D. Normally we generate everything with the quick 3D but you have total control over that. And the reason I'm telling this uh, because this is also something that uh, now we were lucky because uh, after the breakdown the software was remembering these settings but sometimes uh, when the breakdown is so serious the software is sometimes forgetting these options so you will end up with a fancy uh, I mean funny uh, 3D you should check the 3D settings and you should even check whether this is turned on because after breakdown this the object snap is sometimes turned off perfect so that, that's actually what we wanted to talk about when it uh, when it comes to yeah. handling the project <laughs> content and how to make sure that the content is not going to make difficulties with your designing process. Yeah. Now, there's one question here where I think we should cover uh, this. This might not, I think we have covered something like that, but let's just recap this. So the question is about how to add realistic grass in the software. Now, when it comes to visualization, this is mainly a part where third party software would be coming in the picture. We connect to certain third party rendering engines. But if you just want to know how to change the texture of this terrain part, now there's an yeah. option for that. Too. Yeah, that's two things. Uh, here, uh, I would not recommend you to try to bring in, you know, models of um, like what was that patches. called? Batches, patches, yeah. Uh, and multiply them because you will end up with a project that slows down. This is not for that, this is for CAD design. But if you would like to visualize it, you can connect to third-party software, just as you mentioned, that they, they usually have this instance uh, painting where you can re literally paint with grass. What here you can do, uh, and you can, you can make it more uh, realistic, to change this uh, material here and to change that, you have, you have several options, but I, I tend to use this. I find a material, I create a material that I like. Well, let's say I'm just about to find another grass. Um, I don't know, something like this, for example, or this one. I just drag it here, release it, and I say, okay, replace this much material on this object only. And when I click there, it will change the material uh, on the surface. Well, well, it's actually not doing that. Uh, but it's, yeah, okay, it's here, the terrain surface material. Let's just change it to, um, to for example, this one. And uh, okay, so now it's changed and I can do the same thing all around. Now this won't give you real 3D grass for that. You should export your model to FBX or something else and, and uh, import it into software that we also support directly or indirectly via these file formats. Yes. And then you can um, even further you know, expand the visual. Field. Yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much for the explanation. Thanks for the questions and also your attention. And we expect you to be back to us next week on Wednesday where we talk about dimensions and annotations. Uh, we know that we have done several shows about how to make <coughs> layouts and how to make dimensionings, but there's a lot what we haven't told you before. Yeah. So if you want to know how to create uh, great and, and uh, efficient documentation with Arch9, then this is a must attend next Wednesday at 3 p.m., the usual time. Uh, thank you for your questions. Uh, I hope the topic was not too dry and most of you won't experience these issues, but it's worth note about those and know how to solve them when you come to that um, issue. That's right. So. Thank you very much for your attention. See you next time. Bye-bye.